Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. We know lizards were here at one time. There she is. We're looking at reintroducing Texas horn lizards onto areas where they once existed, but now they're gone. I think the greatest thing about bringing the kids out is knowing that Good you're shot. giving them something that they'll literally remember the rest of their lives. Yeah. It is our job to to see that the habitat continues to be conducive to these particular species. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram. We're at the Muse Wildlife Management Area, and this is the site that we've chosen to evaluate the feasibility and the success of a translocation of wild caught Texas horn lizards. Go ahead and grab the next one here. We're looking at reintroducing Texas horn lizards onto areas where they once existed, but now they're gone. We've had a lot of interest over the years in reintroducing lizards to properties, and we've never really looked at the feasibility of even doing that. Will they survive? Where do they go? What will happen? So we're trying to just see if it's possible. Okay, let's get the weight on this lizard. 64. .3. These horned lizards were collected from roadsides on private properties uh, southwest of San Angelo. Okay, good. Several private ranches donated and want to be a part of this project. The lizards go into that predator-proof enclosure so they can acclimate first. We call that a soft release. We've done quite a bit of brush work out here to make the habitat more suitable for lizards, but they need a, a somewhat sandy type soils. They need a good supply of harvester ants. That's the primary diet of horn lizards. They were evaluated and then we brought them on site and we put what we call a pit tag inside each lizard to help identify that animal. 735 AFF3, okay good. We then affixed them with a VHF radio transmitter to track them to get daily locations on each lizard. The frequency for this transmitter is gonna be 150.631. Okay, I think that's her right there. This is Tester's model paint. We paint them with a little bit of model paint and that just helps them to blend into the natural environment here. They're actually glued onto the back uh, using a, a non-toxic eyelash glue that's used in the cosmetic industry. And then we use a collar, which is simply uh, tubing with a fishing line run through it. So far, it's working excellent. All right. And they spend about 10 days in that enclosure. At this point, we let them disperse on their own and we begin our daily tracking. Every day we get these locations and, and the first thing we were interested in is dispersal away from the enclosure site or simply how far are they moving out. She hasn't moved very far lately. Great. Okay, we're getting closer. Yep, there she is. Go ahead and get her GPS location. Mm -hmm. Okay, you got that? Yes, sir. Later in the day, I come in and I plug that into the computer, and we can already start uh, looking at habitat use. These horned lizards use lots of different types of habitat. We have had some predation. It's always sad to lose another horned lizard, but it's a learning opportunity for us to see what's harmful to them. And as we learn more about what's killing these lizards, we'll try to, to avoid that in future releases. We know lizards were here at one time. There she is. 
everybody grew up with them. So it's kind of an iconic animal they grew up with, and now they're not there. People, you know, really want to know why we can't bring them back. 25 points. There have been very few research studies dealing with Texas horned lizards, learning about their habitat use and really what they need in the wild. Horned lizard habitat is good quail habitat, and it's good turkey habitat, and generally good deer habitat. So it's another way to educate people on the importance of just good habitat management. Yes, Probably will be several years out of hope where we really know what's going to happen here, but we're very optimistic. We've actually seen weekly increases in body weight for both males and females. It's an indicator to us that they're finding enough to eat, so that's very important for us. We'd like to really restore these lizards back to much of the state where they're gone. That's kind of our ultimate goal. Where's this one coming from? It's going to be number one. It's going to go out straight away. This is Zach and his cousin, Sean. Call it like you were going to shoot it. Pull. Be patient now. Eight. Boom, right? Let her rip. Both are taking part nice. and taking aim in a weekend duck hunt. Pull. Perfect. It tested like everything, like how much, if he knew how to lead and if he knew where it was coming from and followed through with it. While skeet shooting provides a warm up, the Katy Prairie outside of Houston is the backdrop for this completely outfitted outdoor adventure. What we do is we offer a program, and uh, once they've got their hunter education and they have their hunting license, we can take care of everything else. We can furnish the firearm, we can furnish the ammunition, we furnish the place to hunt. All they have to bring with them is desire to go hunting and enjoy the outdoors. So there's a lot of different species. You know, it's not always just gonna be one certain duck on the pond. Our primary birds are gonna be teal, pintail, shovelers, which we call them spoonbills. Y'all know why we call them spoonbills, right? You see that big noticeable, like a spatula. Big old spoon on their bill. Spoonies, they'll answer to your mallard drake or your mallard hen. The hen really does all the talking. She's out there going. <laughs> this is what we're mainly going to be calling tomorrow. Gentlemen, y'all get in line. Get you something to eat. We got Fritos if you'd rather have like a Frito pie. It's been a long day and all chow down before the big hunt in the morning. What time are we getting up? We're getting up at five o'clock like normal time. Five o'clock in the, in the morning? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so. This is it for tomorrow afternoon? <laughs> no, five o'clock in the morning. This is the first time we've ever been hunting, ever. It's exciting. <laughs> it is. I think I'm, I'm more excited than he is, I think. <laughs> you guys all set? I can range Reveille. <laughs> the thrill of the hunt. About time to rise and shine. Hogs need feeding, cows need milking. And y'all got birds waiting on you. Did you get any sleep? Uh, no. I think it was in between me snoring and him snoring and that guy yeah. snoring. We all took turns snoring. Did you get any sleep? A bit. <laughs> but around midnight, my earplugs fell out and I couldn't find them. I guess we're doing waders and going into a pond or something somewhere. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure what we're doing. It's going to be deep at first, but it'll end up being about this deep when we get to walking. So just stay in single file. Take your time. We got plenty of time, okay? Remember, guys, you see a log, run. 
<laughs> Zigzag pattern, no straight. You all right, Mom? Uh, yeah. Here, let me have your hand. I'll help you out. There you go. The plan in this particular situation is to get them to come into the hole that we've created in the decoys. They're naturally attracted to that void in the decoy spread. <laughs> yeah, he landed way out there. What we see out in front of us where we're actually hunting is some broken marsh area where you can see some grasses and other different types of plants coming up that are attractive to the duck. These wetlands and the surrounding pristine coastal prairie habitat have been wiped out. Replaced with suburbs and subdivisions. The Katy Prairie Conservancy and its preserve is one of the few places left that offers up hunting this close to Houston. Everybody situated? The ducks are kind of coming from the right and the left, and some of them are even coming from that way. Shoot him. Straight up, shoot him. Start at his butt, come through, and right as your gun clears his head, Bang. slap it. But keep swinging. If you stop swinging, he's going to fly past your pattern. I believe it's important for the kids to come out and Ooh. see the quality of life that the Katy Prairie has to offer in such close proximity, one of the largest cities in the country. Are you excited? Yeah. The benefits that a place like this offers kids and their parents to be able to bond is tremendous. I'm kind of nervous and I'm excited that it's my first hunt and we've been practicing out in the range. Straight up, shoot that duck straight up. I have a lead on that one. They're right there. Out front. Good shot. Got him. <laughs> and the dog. It's kind of an adrenaline rush. Yeah. It's like, whoa, and it surprises you. You just show up. They have decoys, they have dogs, they have calls. You know, if you don't have duck hunting equipment, then you can go and see if duck hunting is your thing. Straight up, shoot that duck straight up. Got him. Who shot second? <laughs> got him down there. Ooh, that was a good shot. <laughs> Dang. That one came from, it kind of came from like the middle and like kind of turned up and went to the left and a bunch of us were shooting at him. I didn't realize it was in the water, you know, that we were going to be in the water the whole time. Yeah, just turn the heat up a little bit. <laughs> it's something that he wants to do. You know, that's something he can do forever. Take them, get them. They've started out with the gun safety and, and have taught him, you know, for all the way from beginning to the end. All right, stay low on the left, on the left. Get ready, get ready. Shoot him, shoot him. Bang. Good job, guys. <laughs> it's been great. We got a duck one. <laughs> it's a great program that they put on out here. You know, who else doesn't want to go hunting with their son, you know? Laying in the water, having fun. All right. That was actually pretty fun. It was. It wasn't near as bad as I was thinking it was going to be. He wanted to go hunting, and if it wasn't for this program, you know, I could have never exposed him to that. Then this is something that we can do together, and he still wants me around for it. <laughs> I think the greatest thing about bringing the kids out and seeing them smile is, is knowing that you're giving them something that they'll literally remember the rest of their life. Yeah, I made it. It was fun. Um, we bond in a lot today, and we're going to bond, I guess, bond some more throughout the weekend. I had plenty of fun.
My great grandfather, Albert Giles, founded this ranch in 1885, and he built a house to where our cousin Robin Giles and his family still live, and that was built in 1887. We actually run the livestock on all the old ranch, but we have to answer to about 50 family members that are the owners. Four families primarily represent most of these acres, but many cousins own a slice. Since nature has chosen our property, it is our job to, to see that the habitat continues to be conducive to these particular species. Over 97% of Texas is privately managed. So without private landowners and good stewards like these folks, we don't stand a chance in making strides towards better wildlife habitat. They cooperate well, and the fact that it's all in the family uh, doesn't seem to get in the way. <laughs> I actually own 4.8 acres, but we run from 14 to 18,000 acres, depending on who we're getting along with. <laughs> in the late 1800s, Albert Giles acquired 13,000 acres in the hill country that today is known as the Hillington, Laurels, and Leslie Ranches. Okay, Mern, we're home again. The ranch name comes from the little town of Hillingdon in England that Grandpa came from. It all began when Albert Giles bought three Angus cows from Scotland in 1890. Today, every cow on the place is a descendant of one of those original three. Goats and sheep are also part of the family business. It's a moneymaker or is it? Oh, it's gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go. Robin Giles and his family have been hands-on ranchers for more than 60 years. It's a rare heritage these days, but one that this family has shared for six generations. Cattle, sheep, goats, we manage wildlife. We uh, try to build and maintain relationships with the people that, that uh, allow us to manage their property. One of the ways they do that is with the family newsletter produced by Grant's wife, Misty. Everybody has to find their role in protecting this heritage. Some work here all day long, every day. Others work in town to, to help with the resources. And others deal with the politicians in Austin because that's where the real protection can occur. Today, David Langford spends a lot of time on the road selling and signing books featuring his wildlife photography and history of the ranch. But he's had a long career with the Texas Wildlife Association, fighting for landowner rights, wildlife conservation and natural resource education, and helping water resources. I'd rather been here working, but I was over there in that pink building instead. <laughs> Myrna Langford is a master naturalist and has volunteered more than 1,500 service hours giving presentations and monitoring bats, they have moved in from Mexico. Birds. It's the eastern bluebird. And butterflies. Monarchs will be coming through soon, and they will deposit their eggs on the leaves of the plant, the antelope horn milkweed. Patty Leslie lends her botanical expertise to hill country landowners in urban residents. It's creek plum. It tends to sucker, so it's great for erosion control. Her husband, Greg Pasture, is president of Bear Audubon in San Antonio. Together, they have the flora and fauna covered in the hill country. That's not good. Roy and Jessica Leslie have volunteered more than 4,000 hours helping urban residents understand the importance of rare plant conservation, wildlife habitat, and the dangers of non-native and invasive plants and animals. Well, one cowbird is supposed to add another 40 songbirds. So between invasive plants and the exotic animals, my time's really loaded up. They spend their time managing the ranch and then they, the rest of their time is spent managing the perceptions and opinions and land ethic of the people in their lives. It wasn't very long ago that everybody came from a farm or ranch, but now people don't come from a farm and ranch, so they have no idea what's going on out on the land. And I think the most unique thing about the way we produce meat and fiber is also an environment for a tremendous amount of wildlife too. It can coexist. You can make a living producing and you can preserve the land and the wildlife. Whether on the ranch or off, 
the Giles, Langfords, Leslies, and Pastures continue to serve and cherish the land from which they came. I love the country. It's just the peacefulness out here. It's so pretty and working the different livestock that we have. It's, it's very interesting and it's a good way to raise your kids out here. Hey there, hotshot. It's been a great place to live. So that's what we're going to use today um, to try and figure out what these animals are. I'm going to bring out some furs and some skulls. Where's your skull? Fantastic for the kids. They learn about nature, respecting so nature, our place in front. nature. You have uh, the, the kids uh, get, get to learn and do. And less than an hour from Houston, uh, beautiful scenery. We've got the pileated woodpecker here. Uh, excellent uh, in interpretive services from the park rangers. Well, we're close to Houston area and there's a lot of organized youth groups in the Houston area and they like to come out here because it is close to home. They don't have to go as far. It's nice and quiet. It's safe. We have a real, real nice environment and good facilities. And so they just come out here and, and they have a good time. We have the hardwood bottomland forest here. We have some magnificent trees down in there and birding, some of the best birding in this part of Texas on those trails down there. We have about five miles of trails that meander around the Brazos River. Very scenic and uh, folks really enjoy them. And now with the uh, mountain bikers, it's caught on here now. And so the mountain bikers come out and ride the trails on their bikes as well. When I first came out, we saw that the park um, was, a, it's just a wonderful park. It gets you out of the city. We came out in 2001 and there was probably about two and a half miles of trails and we went ahead and put in another three to four miles of trails and there's about six miles of trails. Most of these trails probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for, for the uh, Houston Off-Road Bicycle Association, the mountain bike groups. They came out and they've done a tremendous amount of work for us. They come out and they help us with trail maintenance so it's really been, we've been blessed. Uh, the first time I saw a dad and his kid riding one of the trails, that just kind of made it all come together, why it's a good thing to build trails in the state parks. And all the wonderful zigzaggy trails that we, we get a, you get a lot of exercise and this is the big park, the wonderful things to see and everything. Don't have to go far to get the beauty of it. It's just pretty and it's peaceful out here and lots of good hiking. Well, my Saturdays are basically uh, spent uh, doing just education, uh, doing hikes and programs. And today it's been, um, I'm about halfway done. I've done two programs and now I'll do two hikes and then a program this evening. So uh, Saturday is the busiest time of, of the week and it's, it's the time that I get to do all this, this fun stuff. We have the eyes facing forward, it's a predator. But it's really uh, trying to get them to enjoy it as much as possible by giving them a little bit more information about what they're seeing. And uh, I love this park. It's just a wonderful park. Just a nice place to be. Description I wear at Enjoy fresh air and open space every day with the Passport to Texas radio series from Texas Parks and Wildlife. Through sounds and words, we'll transport you to places with green grass and blue sky, if only for a minute or two. And sometimes that's all you need. Passport to Texas airs weekdays on radio stations statewide. Visit PassportToTexas.org to find a station near you. And remember, life's better outside.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.